But my first guest tonight was a teenage idol who at the age of 21 earned more than Elvis Presley and whose records outsold even the Beatles. When David Cassidy toured Europe in 1973, more than 15,000 female fans gathered outside his hotel, blocking off traffic in central London. Almost overnight, success turned sour, but after multiple breakdowns, addiction to drugs and sex, the one-time star of the Partridge family is back. I spoke with him earlier this afternoon. Well, after that kind of an introduction, I think I'd better clarify a couple of those statements that were made. Um, oftentimes, um, when one speaks of drug or, and I um, have spoken quite a bit about substance abuse, that I was one of those closet uh, during the late 1970s while I was retired mm -hmm. in the darkest period of my life. I actually never was addicted to anything, although, you know, it's hab habitual and I think self-destructive behavior can be viewed in many different lights and respects. But certainly I went through all of the darkness and uh, the bleakness of it and the sad need for it or the feeling of having a need for it. But did you feel that you, you sounded to me as though you felt at that time you could control it, that if you tried hard enough you could control it? Because to be addicted means you can't. You just there you are. Every day you've got to turn up, you've got to have more drugs or if you're if you're involved in, in women or whatever, you need more women. You're saying you could control all of that. Well, I, I think it was, um, you know, it's a bit of a, of a cliche. Um, however, I, I have to say honestly that there was no, it was a preference and it was a, for me an escape in a lost, um, having lost my own sense of self and identity and purpose in my life at a very early age. I think that the, the problem for me was that um, it all happened to me so soon and so quickly, and you can never be prepared for that. So that, you know, when I chose to drink, I chose to do it out of, there was nothing else to do, boredom, and a sense of, reality is very painful right now, so I don't want to really be here and be that present. It's kind of like taking an aspirin for a headache. And it just became habitual. Um, so that it, it, it really led, one thing led to another, and, and it led to just, Trying to get numb, trying to numb the pain of being here, being this guy, and having it, having your career go down, one uh, go in one direction and then take an immediate 180, and feeling out of control like a, a runaway train. And I think the, for me, the fact that I never went to AA or CA, um, in fact, I one day woke up and said, I can't live like this anymore. I'm gonna stop means I really was never addicted to it. Um, it just became a, a sense of, for me, the ability to say, I'm either going to kill myself, which I'm getting pretty close to doing, or I'm going to stop and turn it around. Because, you know, there is this sense of self-worth and self-love that's here that I've been sort of denying. Mm -hmm. And um, my life made a... It, it took me a couple of years to really rebuild my sense of self and and, you know, self-esteem, I, I think that was, I think I questioned it somehow, for some reason. I think I went through three and a half years of analysis, which was the thing that came around for me. But mm -hmm. in the end, um, you know, your personal choices, and, you know, I never would have chosen to become the label that you introduced me as, which was a teen idol, is something that still haunts me and plagues me in a way. Not that I have any regrets about having done what I've done and I've touched millions of people's lives all over the world. But it's the thing that inhibits me as a creative person, as an artist, that um, has stopped me from being, I think, as successful as I am now becoming or feel like I am now mm -hmm. ten years earlier because they kept labeling me as this sort of heartthrob, teen idol. Uh, all of those things tend to say pretty face no talent. And, and we, have, we have conclusions about them. And it's very simple to put people into those, you know, lovely little compartments. And in a way, it stops you if you are true to your own self and your own creative self, artistic self as an actor, as a songwriter, as a, as a musician. Um, it makes it very difficult to get beyond those barriers. Selena Scott, she's a, well, she's a chat show host. Well, no, she's a serious journalist. What are you? Well, I have to keep saying to people, no, I'm not really that. Because if every time you get introduced as this, well, she's just this fluff chat show host. That's not what you are at all. But if you have to keep saying, no, no, I'm not really that, or are you defensive about it? 
<laughs> Suddenly, I you look perfectly. like you have a problem. You know? I, I understand perfectly. And, and I, 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 I've never been defensive about my past in that respect. Of the fact that I've had fans and people, I, I feel very blessed and very lucky that I've had a whole, I have had two careers, three careers, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on my third year now, and the most enjoyable part of it is now. But haven't you, you mentioned about being good looking? And how uh, it, it, you've been, you've been, you've been. <laughs> I often ask you, this is, this, is, this, is, this is a problem. This is a problem. It's always been a problem through your life, it seems to me, because you came through the 60s and 70s. 70s. Well, yes. I started really. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but you were so, uh, these women uh, mm -hmm. uh, would do anything for mm -hmm. David Cassidy, mm -hmm. I recall distinctly. Now, you know, there were guys coming through, like Mick Jagger, mm -hmm. uh, guys who well, looked as though they were rough looking guys mm -hmm. who, who were taking the headlines. Mm -hmm. All of that was happening as well as everything that you were going through with your career. Right. I, I had a choice that at one point when I was playing the stadiums and walked away with uh, living the existence of Elvis and Michael Jackson and being you know, very few people on the planet, which was to continue to carry on and to become this myth and illusion that I had become with bubblegum clouds, lunchboxes, comic books, mm -hmm. you know, every possible kind of merchandising in a world that wasn't merchandised at the time, you know, when they weren't selling posters. I played Madison Square Garden the day after James Taylor played it, in like 73, whatever it was. And he sold 16 posters, which they didn't sell posters in those days. I sold 16,000 the next day. So it was a merchandise experience. And the people that benedict, benefited from it in those days, in the naive world that we lived in, were the people that were standing outside selling the merchandise. It never ended up in my pocket. Um, it's been bootlegged, and my name and my likeness. Now the attorneys have become very sophisticated. The business has become very sophisticated, and actors and, and pop stars have become very wealthy from it. Mm -hmm. I really got n next to nothing for the merchandising. They sold somewhere in the vicinity of five hundred million dollars worth of merchandising. I think I got a check for fifteen thousand dollars. And didn't you? Thing. And you didn't know then. I mean, you no, no one knew. So you had your dad around, surely? You had your you, you had yeah, people around no who, who around. knew about these things? No one was around. My father was a very credible actor and had never sold a record. He'd never sold, no one had ever bought a poster. No one knew, knew about it. And we forget because in the 70s, until the mid-70s, when it really started to get, the end of the 70s, when it really started to get cranked up, it was still a quite little artist business. It was, you know, artists ran record companies. It became a marketing and a merchandising and they understood, and they sell records much better now. Any artist that was around them would say it's not mm -hmm. anywhere near as much fun. However, when you get robbed of your own identity and you have no control over them making up math dresses mm -hmm. and, you know, crap, really, that I was really resentful not for being ripped off myself, but for ripping the fans off for selling them junk, mm -hmm. you know. And I thought, if you're going to represent me, just give them good stuff. Sell them good things, something that represents who I am, as opposed to this you know, made up, a built up, you know, um, it was a naive world that we lived in, far more naive than we are now. The audience is much more sophisticated, and in a way, those kinds of fan mania, um, uh, uh, where it's hysteria, is no longer, because fans, and the audience is so much more sophisticated. We live in this global world with, here in NBC Super Channel. In London, I used to come here, you know, you can get a shower, let alone see something from America, an American newspaper. Mm -hmm. So it's it's much more of a global war that we live in now. We're so much more connected, and consequently, because of communication, we're so much more sophisticated that those kinds of things will never happen. You know, they turned, they destroyed six limousines when I, when I played in New York. I, I mean, to say things Who like that. Who destroyed them? Fans. They turned them over. They flipped them over. That kind of hysteria. Mm -hmm. You know, they're doing this Beatle anthology now, and I looked at it, and Someone said to me, he said, you know, there's probably five people on the planet that understand that those guys, three of them and you and maybe one other person that would understand that kind of madness. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really what drove me away from it because I couldn't, I couldn't walk down the street. I couldn't have a real normal life and people could no longer, when I would meet them, they would, they would assume that I was all of that stuff that they had read about me. And, and in a way, um, it was all fabricated to sell mm -hmm. that imagery which was making so many people so much money except me. But so you weren't interested in them because you, you're a clever, boy, a clever man. You must have known at that stage I, I that, all this was, that all this was happening. All I these women out there meant money. Mm -hmm. um, I never, I never, 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 never
Yeah, so I'm always been driven by the work. I mean, I, I honestly, I mean, it just sounds. I was driven by my love for. I come from an actor's family, mm -hmm. you know, totally unsophisticated human beings. I, I I became the first person to ever enter college, you know, in my family. It's, it's not. It's not really good when it comes to businesses. No one in my family knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, they had no concept of that money, and it was never something that was spoken about. Like when you when you grow up, you're going to become good at something. It's not you're going to become rich. You're going to become famous. That wasn't my intent at all. Um, my father was a great example, and he had great work ethic, and taught me a lot. And he did 37 Broadway shows, and he was the actor's actor. He worked all the time. And his, his influence on me was that um, you have the talent, and talent will survive. He said this to me when I was peaking my fame. I played White City Stadium here in London, and uh, I was on the stadium tour, the last tour I did. And he took me aside before I went and said, let me tell you something. When you end this, and you're going to end it, you're going to walk away from it, it's going to get very chilly for you. It's going to be very difficult for you. But I want you to remember this always. And it's funny how, you know, very few things he said to me really stuck with me, but I knew this was an important one. He said, talent will survive, mm -hmm. and that's the only thing I want to do about it. Can you survive? Can you survive? In the end, let them say what they will about you. And it's difficult being compared to it, because people oftentimes say to me, well, don't you wish you had it like these days or everywhere you went? No, I really don't. Um, it was great to have been, had that kind of impact. You know, you always, you artists really always want attention. But the work that I get to do now, being in Blood Brothers for the last couple of years, and getting acknowledged for my talent as a songwriter, as a singer, as an entertainer, as an actor, is so much more gratifying for me now. My life is so much richer now that I have control over it. You know, I, I, I think that, for me, the definitive moment was when I did walk away from it and said, I'm going to choose this path. Okay, it's a more difficult path. But the other way was just a, it, it was a sense of being in a vacuum mm -hmm. um, and feeling lost, feeling empty, and having no one to share it with, no one to appreciate it. One thing the Beatles had was each other. At least they, they came from somewhere together and could think, Jesus, can you believe what's going on? You know, I'd look in the mirror and go, can you imagine what's going on? Mm -hmm. You know? And in a way, that's the emptiness and loneliness of doing it by yourself and what killed Elvis. I'm sure of it. I'm going to stop you for a minute. So I want to take a break. I want to come back and talk to you some more. Because mm -hmm. uh, you said there are two things there that I, I want to pick up on. First of all, the talent that you've been talking about and where your talent is now and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Because that's very important. But also, your father mm -hmm. and what your father has meant to you through all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, because he let you down too, in a way, which I think uh, our viewers might find interesting. I'm talking to David Cassidy. Stay with us. I'll be right back. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, I'm speaking with the singer and actor, David Cassidy, who is now in London, performing in Blood Brothers. We were talking about a four-week run together. Mm, yeah, finished January the 6th, December 11th, January 6th. It was, for me, um, kind of the icing on the cake the last, almost on and off for two and a half years mm -hmm. on Broadway with Two O'Clock and my brother and, you know, the soul and the voice of Willie Russell, who speaks... Yeah, you know, and he's just a great writer, and I have such respect for him. Having done this play, you know, it, this play has meant so much to me that um, I can't seem to walk, I, every time I walk away from it after leaving it after a year on Broadway, and I walked away from it and thought, right, that's it. And um, but the, the next day I walked it out, and I, was, I did the Tonight Show the next day. And uh, I, I walked out and thought, this is the first night, my first night off. God, am I back there doing it? Or, 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 or. Okay, I miss that. I needed a vacation so badly, but it's such the stuff that I worked and have looked for as an actor, as a human. Mm -hmm. This man, he ages 25 years in this piece. Um, and, and his life is so rich, and he has such a love for it, and he has such compassion for it. You know, he loses, he has such a strong, survivor instinct mm -hmm. that through all of it he maintains a sense of light and, and optimism and everything that can possibly come out of this way in his life. 
but he has such a joy and an appetite for life. You know, that to play him every night, I've never gotten bored. I've never played a role in the theater more than six months. And usually by the fourth month, mm-hmm. you're going, Phew. you know, oh, this has been great. Oh, gotta, gotta, gotta go, you know. I, I got six months in this Well, I haven't even gotten to the bottom of it, you know. There's so much in the past like that. The play never, it just always works. I hear you've got a great little cuddly in that <coughs> I, have, I know that people have been to see you and they've mm-hmm. thought, well, I'm going to go and see David Cassidy now. Hey, mm-hmm. and when they get there and they see that you can act mm-hmm. and you can do it yeah. so well. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the, uh, that's the stuff in the mm-hmm. end that it's about. It's, you know, you can get them and the, the wonderful thing is for me is that people come to see me mm-hmm. and pay money to see me. And if you're a star, you know, in a way, <coughs> you have two ways of going. That's uh, you continue to sell tickets or you're out of the business. <laughs> and, um, and once you get them in the seats, then you got to deliver. And, uh, and how do you deliver? I mean, how do you manage to get hmm. into, the, into this role? You're, I mean, you're an American boy. Yeah. Right? How do you manage to get the accent, get the thing right, to yeah. get the thing to sell to the yeah. guys out there? Here's the thing that about the piece that the, the role that I play is that he's a very much uh, from a working class environment. And, and contrary to public opinion, I did not grow up in Hollywood. I grew up, my father left my mother and I when I was three. And we grew up in, in an, a little town, a blue collar town, in a blue collar street, in a row house. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't call it a row house. It's very, I don't know how to describe it, very, very lower middle class mm-hmm. income. Working class. This is your mom rather than your father. Mom, yeah. yeah. My mom, who was a struggling actress, and a good one, but a very, you know, struggling actress in, in the 1950s. Um, you know, most people on the street were, they worked in factories, they worked, you know, as plumbers, carpenters. So I come from a family of carpenters and builders. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a very much a family environment, much like I grew up with my grandparents, my mom, I had cousins and uncles. And they were my support system through my broken home. And because um, I was an only child, and my dad really pretty much deserted us. Mm-hmm. Moved to Hollywood, you know, and bought the whole dream. Married a movie star and had another family. And really didn't want to be reminded of, for guilt reasons, of his mistake and error. And the fact that I never heard from him. And I didn't see him for a long period of time. Very painful for me. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the problems that resulted later on in my life. Um, the alcohol and the substance abuse and all that happened as a result of that thing, that early thing. Mm-hmm. You know, you learn a lot about yourself and then you're on. But um, that working class environment really very much mirrored what Mickey's life is. His big family, they had very little, but they appreciated everything they had. And, and in a way, I got to move to the country like mm-hmm. Mickey does. And then um, it's very difficult for David to sit and have a David conversation about me and then mm-hmm do the switching to Liverpool, you know, but mm-hmm. he's very much uh, a working class man, and he speaks from that stuff, and I think that's universal, and that's why the play worked in America, even though a lot of the, a lot of the very Liverpoolian aspects of the play that mm-hmm. we could view, Americans couldn't understand, but it's very much a human aspect that everybody can understand. Um, it has such heart and such soul and such power mm-hmm. that the great thing is to see people come in who didn't like me and who were sort of dragged in the scene. You know, uh, you know, and in the end, they come. The best compliment I got from them, I think, is people I had no idea what to do. You know? Mm-hmm. So that's why I continue to do it because I still love to do it and people's reaction to it. And after you do it, you have the, you know, the best of it all. Come here for four weeks. And get mm-hmm. to do it on the British stage because the American actors rarely get to come here to hear and work because they take jobs away from British actors, and rightfully so. It's just as difficult for British actors to come to America. You have to sell tickets, you have to justify it, mm-hmm. you have to be a lead, and something that there isn't another one. And I think equity classifies it. Mm-hmm. Is there another person that could do this? So. Uh, you, you, um, and you obviously feel now that you're 
your career, if you want to call it that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> a sad excuse for a career? Well, I mean, Is that know. what you meant? No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I was looking back on your life, thinking of oh. how, we d how you describe what's happened to you and yeah. where you are now. I suppose you could talk about new beginnings. Yeah. But I, I mean, I wouldn't say it is a career. I would say it is just you. It's you learning a different craft, maybe, but something that you're enjoying doing. But what I wanted to say to you, what I was going to ask you about, was your father and this, mm. this idea that he had that you had such talent and he, s he supported you through, mm. he must have supported you when you were going through a pretty tough period, but then mm. he deserted you, didn't he? Well, actually, he didn't support me. He would come and he was very resentful of the things that kept him home. Um, he would, on one hand, try and, and I would, ins I heard that he would talk to most people. When he was around me, he was jealous. It was his own wounds, emotional wounds, that he never achieved the kind of fame and success I did. Mm -hmm. And in a way, he had all of the kudos and laurels that, as an actor, but no one knew who he was, really. He was never a big star. Um, and that eluded him, frustrated him, because he had such incredible talent. He could write, he could paint, he could sculpt. He had such humor, he had wit, he had a voice as a singer. It was ridiculous. You know, it was so intimidating to be around. The talent and the charisma that he had. I meet people today, you know, I meet people who are baggage handlers at the airport, elevator operators. He treated everybody the same way. Actors. He treated everyone um, as if they were important to him, special to him. And I learned a lot about how to conduct myself with people because. I mean, he was a great influence to me. I revered him. I loved him. What I really wanted most in the world, like most boys do with their father, is to put his, I put his arm around me and say, you know what, you're great. I love you. And I'm really proud of you. But he really could never do that. So it was always this longing to have him go, look at me, Dad. Aren't I doing well? Aren't I doing well? And he'd go, yeah, well, next time I'm sure you did a lot better. Mm -hmm. that way. I would walk away going, I was so intimidated. Yeah, but he was fighting with his sexuality as well, wasn't he? Was I think it wasn't just that. Really? No, I think, I think I, you know, I knew speculation. Mm -hmm. I think it, that may have been the case. I've read things about him. I've never met anyone who said to me, I knew your father in a different way. Mm -hmm. But I have no problem with that. You know, I, I, with anybody's choice of their own sexuality, I think it's... But your dad? No, I don't. I don't have a problem. Not at all. I wanted him to be happy. I wanted, you know, when you care and love someone, you love them unconditionally. Like. Mm -hmm. All I really wanted him to do was find peace in his life. My father had a nervous breakdown about a year and a half before he died. I didn't speak to my dad the last nine months of his life. I was in a hell in my own. Um, he iced everybody out of his life, his brother, his sister. You know, he saw, if you didn't see the world according to him, you couldn't be in his life. I actually can remember this, and I promise it's true. When he was having a nervous breakdown, no one quite understood it, what was going on, but I'm in the midst of, I've just retired, just left it, and trying to find a, a sense of my own self, who I am. We go out to lunch together at one of his restaurants, you know, my dad's restaurants. He's got an ascot on, I show up in jeans, you know, and a t-shirt. <laughs> it's like 1975. And, you know, big, you know, taller, the whole thing. And he, he's sitting at the bar, smoking, drinking a scotch. You know, and he's talking philosophy about the world. And, and you had to sit there and listen, of course, and yes, that, yes, that. And this woman walks up, taps him on the shoulder, and says, Excuse me, Mr. Cassidy, may I borrow a cigarette? And he goes, Sorry, I quit. <laughs> she goes, <laughs> Yeah, right. May I borrow a cigarette? Mm -hmm. No, I'm not kidding. I, I did quit. Oh, this? Yes, I'm smoking, but I quit mentally. And he believed it. That's how mad. <laughs> one foot in, one foot out. And you couldn't argue with it. Mm -hmm. You couldn't say, Dad, you smoke it. He'd look at you like, okay, okay, I know if I say something, I'll never hear from you or see you again. And that's what happened. One day I had a confrontation with him. I said, Dad, you know what? This is it. I can't do this. Do me a favor. Please. Take a look at it. You know, and, and just even talking about it. And we got into this huge thing. He broke furniture at my, my manager's house. We went, because no one could talk back to him. He was so powerful a person. And, and 
and I'm, God, you know, talking about it now as an adult, as opposed to being 24 or 5, emotionally, because I went through the career I went through, I was pretty much an emotional cripple. I wasn't an adult at 25. I was like 19, maybe. Um, but I, I regret not being big enough to say, you know, Dad, life is that fast. And all I really want you to do is to join us around the world. Like all fathers do. He set a great example for me as a father there with my son. Because everything he didn't do with me, I did with my son. And your son, we've got to finish shortly, but your son is how old now? He's four and a half. Is he? Yeah, he's with me. And you're married? Mm, you're married, married. Happily and married. Happily married to my wife, Sue, who's with me today. And the next thing, songwriting, mm. more acting. I'm in the midst of doing an album right now. Um, I'm going back to America. I've got a film to do. Um, after I finish the album, then I'm going to go on tour. And uh, I've got a, a theatrical musical in development for 97. So next year is going to be about music and career. And I hope to come back to the end of Europe where I haven't toured in years and years. But it's a very exciting time for me. I, I creatively have all the stuff going that I wished and longed for that was not there for me. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, the fact that I've had an impact on people. I don't have to say any more, David Carlton. You look great, Thank and you're you. sounding just as good as you ever sound. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. It's been great to have you. We'll take another quick break. I'll be back in just a moment. Don't go away. See you then. Mm-hmm. 